So uh, for maximum comprehension, I'm going to be uh, speaking in English today because I know that uh, for us Danes, the further you get up in, in Sweden, the harder it is to understand. And I've heard many of my Swedish uh, friends say that Swedish is a lot like Danish, only it's like you're speaking with a potato in your mouth. <laughs> so um, let's uh, make it happen. So uh, my name is Jesper Arko. I'm a physical therapist. I've been active uh, treating for the past 10 years. I'm also a guest lecturer at the Danish College for Physical Therapy. And I also work a lot with uh, physical rehabilitation in VR. And uh, I've got a lot on my mind, so let's see if we can make it within the time frame. So um, this is me, uh, believe it or not, it's an MR picture of my neck from 2010. Uh, after a training accident in martial arts, I was uh, partially paralyzed in my left arm. And I, as a physical therapist, you always get told that the golden standard for, for knowing what's wrong is an MRI. And I had lost my function in my left arm and I went to the doctor and they said, oh, well, we can't really see anything. But maybe there's something here, we don't know. Uh, but we can operate and see if it, it, it's better. And I said, no, uh, let, let's just try it with the train. And then they said, ooh, but don't train. It's ooh, you will only, only make it worse. But as a physical therapist, you know that uh, if you don't train, especially with neurological diseases, it only gets worse. You say, use it or lose it. Uh, so I started rehabilitating and it was, uh, to say the least, a long and slow process. Uh, took about a year for me to regain around 90% of function in my left arm, um, which has kind of stayed that way. It's not, never going to be uh, fully uh, back, but that's how it went. And I came to a very shocking conclusion about um, my profession as a physical therapist. And that is that physical therapy is boring. <laughs> and it is supremely frustrating over time. Um, and even though I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about my work and when I'm with my clients, but when you're alone with the physical therapy, one of the most frustrating things is that it's very hard to measure your progression. When I was rehabilitating, I was very uh, subtly writing down every repetition that I could do more to keep the motivation because a year is a long time to slowly regain your your, your function and one of the things that kept me motivated was keeping track of it so I thought there must be some kind of way to make it more fun and easier to keep uh, uh, track of the progression so it's no secret that I'm also a big computer nerd and uh, I've also always been interested in VR. I'm just at that age that I was not able to try the, the headset at the, uh, the arcades around. Um, and I always wanted to do that. And when the HTC Vive came out, I thought, I'm going to buy this. And I'm uh, going to buy this so I can play some games. And I'm going to uh, cheat a little bit in Texas, so I'm going to write it off in my company. And, and then, uh, then my accountant said, uh, uh, I can see what you're doing here, but I, I can't really see the, you know, bridging the gap between virtual reality games and physical therapy. If if tax comes and asks some questions, it's you're gonna have to find a good excuse. And uh, what I did was uh, I tried to find some software at the time. We're back in 2016 now, and there wasn't any software. So since I'm an entrepreneur, I made it my goal that I want to build something. And what I've built, we're going to talk about a bit later, but what is really interesting about physical therapy is that we're used to taking snapshots of, for example, mobility. So we'll measure the patient when they come in to start with, and then maybe after a few weeks we'll see how the progression is. So we were only taking snapshots. The, the interesting thing about the virtual reality technology today is that we are constantly seeing what's happening in real time. And that's we're kind of lifting the veil of the mystery of movement here because when doing physical therapy, we're very um, dependent on what the physical therapist sees all the time. And we're making approximations on, oh, maybe it's 90 degrees, maybe it's 93 degrees. We can't really see the progression. With virtual reality here now, 
we can see everything that's going on. And some of the things that uh, a lot of the other people have said that when you have that kind of position, you can do extraordinary things. So the first thing that we wanted to build was something that can measure range of motion very quickly and very precisely. Here's a demo of uh, us having a patient and, and me doing the physical therapy stuff. And we can see that we can actually measure the range of motion as fast as the patient can raise their arm and document it at the same time. If there's something I hate about physical therapy, it's the documentation process. <laughs> I, I know it's, it's not uh, well heard, but I, I want to spend my time face to face with my clients. That's where, where the stuff really happens. The most appealing thing for me about games, or the games, is that you can put exactly the movements you want. The game has no limits. And it's an occupational therapist at the Falkelsen called Jenny. When we showed her the first prototype uh, that we're working with up in Finland, she was very excited. And that's, that's part of the thing that I'm excited about as well. As all the other speakers here have been talking about, we can make immersive environments and we can make the gameplay mechanics correspond to the physical therapy that we want to do. And that's, that's really interesting because, like I said, it's tedious, it's repetitious, it's boring, but if we can combine those movements with games, it gets really exciting. Uh, right now, it has a wide range of use cases, vestibular training. So uh, who in here has tried VR and gotten a little bit motion sick? So a, a few of you guys. What happens is that the eye tries to process the information coming and it, it communicates to our vestibular or balance sense and it, uh, there's a mismatch there. But you can actually, with the proper programming and the proper headsets, you can actually, um, uh, what's the word now? Well, you can, you can train your balance actually while sitting still, which is very exciting. Um, there's a wide range of uh, uses cases in uh, neurological rehab after a stroke and there's a lot of uh, science right now that tells that it's a great great supplement to physical and occupational therapy so they can actually raise their amount of training while not with a the therapist which is awesome you can do a lot with posture control you can also do fitness just regular training which is just a very high level of rehabilitation post-operative rehab and some of the stuff that I'm most excited about is the research aspect. So when people are training now, we're getting loads of data. Before we were getting like one data point every week when we would measure and document. Right now we get the entire movement that the patient has done throughout the entire training. Huge, huge data sets, which we can use for research. So we can start to predict which are the correct movements, uh, what creates the less uh, pain. We can start to predict outcomes, so if you train this much with these movements, when are you going to be uh, healthy again? It just, this is really awesome. So, like I've been leading up to, the magic really happens when technology and the different disciplines meet. Deep learning, uh, some of you guys have talked about like patient education and education in general. It's, it's, a, it's a magical medium for education because studies have shown that there's a higher retention of the knowledge when you use VR because you're using the different sensory modalities. Telepresence, for example, in Finland, it's going to be awesome that the physical therapist can actually stand in Helsinki and have a session with uh, someone up north of the polar circle without even uh, moving. And like I said, predictive care and diagnostics, this is going to be Awesome, and this is some of the stuff that we are working on. And so, some physical therapists that I talked with, they said, oh, but won't it take time away from my patients? No, because it actually gives you more time for what really matters. Since the system can document um, while the patient is trained, this is time we save when we're with the patient. So if the patient trains while we're not there, we already know how much they've trained, how much pain they're in, and how much movement they've gained over the past uh, time. And more importantly, we can get people to train while we're not there. One of the most frustrating things about being a physical therapist is that we send a patient home 
for a week and we say, do these exercises. We hand them a piece of paper and then when they come back, you ask, so did you do the exercises? And they say, well, uh, some of them and and that, that severely hampers the progression they can make. So if we can get them to train more, we can get them to get to their outcomes even faster. So uh, you may or may not have seen, we've been in a little bit of the Swedish media about this organization called Folkhelsen. Do you know what Folkhelsen is? Some of you. It's a Swedish organization that operates in Finland for the Swedish speaking Finns. It's a care organization that has uh, elder care centers and all kinds of stuff. It's an elmi nerdy organization. And um, they wanted to do this uh, for their elderly citizens. Right now, we're in place in, in uh, three care centers, expanding to, I think, about 15 in the new year. And we're, we're building it on the experiences on three principles. We want to make it safe, because we know with patients, they don't feel safe, they don't do the stuff. We want to make it motivating, and we want to make it challenging, because we want them to uh, progress. We want them to get better while actually using it. So we've created something that can measure range of motion accurately down to two degrees and as fast as the patient can raise the sun. Uh, we've implemented a system that can reduce the chance of overreaching with over 80%. So when you're working with people with a physical disability, you don't want them to overreach. You don't want them to add more pain. So you need something to make sure that they're safe there. <coughs> We've made a system that scales according to the patient's range of motion. So if they can only move their hand there, the experience scales it. So you start here, and then as you get better, things get higher up, you reach more, you move more. So we can get the progression. And we've hidden all exercises in games. So what we've done is not just a, a virtual physical therapist that comes and says, oh, no, raise your arms and bend your legs. No, everything is hidden. Kind of like the experience uh, the guys at HiQ showed with the, the you would show the fish. Oh, sorry. Oh, big one. Uh, no, it was you, right? With the fishing experience. So all these kinds of movements we can use in physical therapy. It's just a question of designing what we want the patient to do. So what we're doing behind the scenes is we're training a deep learning algorithm. So all the movement data we're getting in we can use to predict which movements are good for the patients in this part of the rehabilitation, which are bad, and like I said, predict when the outcome will uh, be good. And we've got a lot more that I can't talk about on the roadmap. So this is just a few pictures of the, the experiences that we have going on in Finland right now. They are very explicit about we want to do something in the forest. So we've created a virtual woodshed in the forest where the patients can come in, do woodwork, uh, chop down trees for the wood, pick flowers, and we're adding some more stuff as well. You can see here, they can build a, a little cart. Um, something else we've made is something with uh, the working title is the forest ride, uh, where the patient or the citizen rides through the forest and interacts with different elements. Um, We've also introduced the scaling stuff, so they actually reach for berries, mushrooms, uh, look for um, uh, woodpeckers and, and stuff like that. So they can enjoy nature without them actually going there. Um, and I just want to show a quick video when we were showing the uh, first prototype at the one of uh, Paul Kelsen's shoes. So uh, what I want you to uh, notice here is a uh, very elderly citizen here who's been sitting for a while and not doing a lot of activity. And uh, uh, or be aware of what happens when the nurse tries to take the headset away from her. Oh, 
Yeah. So just like most of the other experiences you've seen here, it's all about creating that wow experience for the uh, for the citizen who's going to use it. Uh, yeah, that's that's her and my uh, my partner in uh, Finland. Um, and what I wanted to say is that it's much easier to get started than you would expect. Um, I notice uh, a lot of of worry about will the technology be hard to to get into, and it's actually not. Usually, if you talk to some of the people who are actually going, they will have some kind of experience with, yes, of course, there was a little barrier to start with, but then I talked to some people I know, I watched some YouTube videos, and it was actually it's very easy to get going. So when you're thinking about getting started, uh, started more or less, just jump in. It's okay to, to learn by doing. Uh, if any of you are sitting in the audience right now and want to know how to get started, I'm holding a workshop. It's workshop number two, uh, where I talk about how to get started, um, how to implement who are the, the key people you need to find in your commune to help it get going, how to make good networks, what's the proper equipment, and all that kind of stuff. And like I said, it's, it's much easier than you might think. If you want to get in touch with us, um, we're available at this address. We do a lot of work on social media where you can um, see what we're doing. Yeah. On a, actually, on a, a, a daily basis, we're very busy. Uh, but you can also contact us on, on our email and uh, our website, of course. So I kind of rushed through my presentation. So there would be some time for questions. Because that, that's really why I'm here. I want to answer your questions because me just talking about stuff is secondary to answering you, uh, you guys' questions. So thank you for your time now and let's take some questions from the audience. No questions, all right. Yeah. I can ask, yeah. do you want to throw me the box? Yes, Get it on? I okay. think so. Let's try it. There we go. Yay. Hey, hello. Um, so, do you sell these experiences? Like, uh, are you planning to ship them and oh, license yes. them yeah. and yeah. so forth? And yes, so on? of course. It's super um, interesting. Yeah. That yes, I'm working. I, I, I'm, I, we already have a commercial uh, product. We're going to have another product launch uh, at the at the start of the new year. In addition, with us uh, completing our prototypes with Paul uh, Kelsen. So we already have a fully functional product that can um, that can be deployed. Right now we're using the HTC Vive for the experiences. There will be some of the experiences that can also work on the more uh, mobile platforms. But uh, like the, you guys talked a lot about, you wanted the highest quality of tracking and experience, and that's why you're working with a computer and a headset. There's actually some recent um, evidence that working with a headset uh, actually has a lot better effect on uh, pain experience, for example, compared to the mobile devices. Also, I would imagine, and I can't say this for sure, but a lot of the people who experience motion sickness while doing VR is usually on the mobile headsets. And one of the reasons is that the refresh rate, the number of pictures you get to see per second, is about 75. And you need to be 90 pictures or above for it to be a, like a really smooth experience uh, and that's that's why we're choosing to, to give the highest quality of um, experience yeah and i know it's 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 the worst possible spot to be on just before lunch you know people are tired they're thinking about food like oh can we get this yeah but that's off stage so we can actually get something to eat but like i said for the people who are interested in getting uh, getting started, I'm at workshop number two, and feel free to approach me when I uh, get off stage and be more than willing to uh, talk to you guys. So, uh, thanks to Mitke and uh, see you guys soon.